Hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Dan Strumpf. I am a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and a correspondent governor here at the SCC. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be the host for tonight's event with Professor Ron Mitter from Oxford University. Uh, the event will be hosted by Jody Schneider, our club president. Um, before we get to Professor Mitter, um, I'd like to just uh, highlight some upcoming events that we've got at the SCC. We've got uh, a, a good handful of events coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday morning at the club, we are uh, hosting a breakfast um, for the vice presidential debates in the US. We'll be broadcasting that live from the club tomorrow morning. We've got a buffet breakfast as well to go along with that. Um, and this is actually the second debate that we're hosting at the club and we'll be hosting live breakfast for all the US debates, uh, all, all of the US presidential debates coming up as well. Um, and then uh, next week, we've also got an upcoming Zoom event with Sebastian Strongio. Uh, Mr. Strongio is the Southeast Asia editor at The Diplomat magazine, um, and he's also the author of In the Dragon's Shadow, Southeast Asia in the Chinese Century, and that book examines the impact of Beijing's rising economic and political power in the region, um, and that event will be on October 12th over Zoom, just like this one. Um, and so uh, with that, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Professor Rana Mitter. Uh, Professor Mitter is director of the China Center at the University of Oxford. Uh, he's also the author most recently of the book, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping Up a New Nationalism. Uh, Professor Mitter in his book argues that China's reassignment, um, sorry, China's reassessment of World War II has been central to its confidence abroad and to its rising nationalism at home. This new narrative that he posits positions Beijing as the guardian of the international order that has emerged from the uh, that has emerged from that war, and that is now under threat from the U.S. Um, so uh, I'll, soon, I'll soon turn this over to uh, to Jody. Uh, just want to remind everybody that this event is being broadcast live. Um, over Zoom, and we'll also have this event uh, available on YouTube, uh, just as we do with all of our events um, after it's over. Um, and then please do send over your questions as well. We'll be taking questions uh, from viewers. You can send questions to uh, the following email address, question, singular, at fcchk.org. That's question at fcchk.org. Um, and with that, I will... Uh, turn it over to Jody uh, for the talk. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. And thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you to the professor who's joining us from Oxford, where his, you can see all the bookcases. You can see he's a real professor because he has lots of books. <laughs> um, and this is an extremely timely talk. Uh, we are less than a month away from the US election. And the China uh, US tensions are increasing almost by the day. And the new nationalism, of which uh, Professor Mitter writes, is um, also seems to be increasing almost daily. But first, I want to welcome uh, Professor as an honorary correspondent, as you have done freelance radio broadcasting uh, as a presenter for BBC Radio 3 and BBC World Service, and not only on China. So uh, when we can have events uh, here again, we want you to come to the club, and, uh, and we'll give you your honorary correspondence status <laughs> at the time. So um, my first question, before we get to the content of the book, tell us about what led you to write it. Why so World War II? Why World War II is the focus, and how did this build on your earlier work and scholarship? Thank you, Jody. First of all, let me say how grateful I am to have this chance to speak to this distinguished company. Like you, I wish that I were able to get over to Hong Kong, past the British quarantine, and enjoy a drink in your splendid bar, which I've visited several times. Not least since I know that right now, or in a few days' time, there's going to be a fascinating new exhibition of pictures from the mid-1980s by your member Patrick Dransfield, who uh, I think is going to recall the glory days of the early reform years. And I've seen some of those pictures uh, electronically. They'll look even better, I think, in your, uh, yeah. in your bar. So They're hanging I, there right now. And anybody well, who's in Hong Kong who hasn't seen them should come in. It's, it's quite an exhibit. I highly recommend it, absolutely. Um, and again, thanks for the question for the origin of this. And in a sense, I would say that this is a question that has been bugging me for really more than 20 years. In other words, the time that I have moved from being a 
graduate student, which was uh, quite a while ago now, uh, through the kind of stages of uh, pupa and chrysalis into uh, um, a, uh, an academic, uh, in those days I had uh, more hair and less of a stomach. But one thing that was running through that entire period, and which I found myself more and more puzzled that actually very few observers from outside China seemed to say very much about, was a particular historical obsession that I could see in China with the Second World War, by which I mean the following. If you were to ask you know, the good folk in, in this uh, webinar, who all I know are very, very China savvy, what are the historical events you most associate with modern Chinese history? Maybe, and perhaps I'm pushing it, but maybe people would say, oh, opium wars, or you know, Hong Kong obviously is a great place to, to recall the, the, the opium wars uh, one way or another. Uh, the Cultural Revolution, you know, Mao's rise to power, whatever it might be. But the Second World War as a Chinese event isn't something that people tend to bring up all that much. And that seemed to be more and more odd when I saw not just the way in which the history of the war has been remembered in China, and I think we'll get back to that in, in just a few minutes, but actually the way that it's so present in everyday life in China itself. So by which I mean, I've been, as many others may have been several times, to the museum commemorating the war just outside Beijing at the Marco Polo Bridge, where you know millions of school children have trooped through over the years. Uh, you'll all know that the big blockbuster movie this summer was Ba Bai, the 800, which made, I think, over 300 million at the Chinese box office uh, when the cinemas reopened uh, there. You know, video gamers, uh, the biggest TV series this uh, autumn, this um, summer, I should say, was Autumn Cicada, also set during World War II. In other words, memories and understandings of World War II are all around you when you go to China and have been for 20 or 30 years. And I wanted to put together an argument that asked, why are they so obsessed with World War II? Is it in the same way that we in countries like Britain or the US are obsessed with it or a different way? And how does it affect the way that China thinks about itself today? Hence the new nationalism. Yeah, I wanted to focus on the good war in the title. Uh, how and why has China reassessed World War II? How has this narrative emer emerged and why do China's leaders feel this is a useful narrative at this time? Well, I chose the title China's Good War deliberately to try and provoke comment and thought, uh, Jody. And for those of people who know American history, they'll know that in fact it's an ironic take on an ironic take, by which I mean a, a wonderful book dating from the mid 1980s by the great American oral historian Studs Terkel. And he wrote a book called The Good War, which was, many people will know, I'm sure, but just a reminder, a collection of oral histories, you know, reminiscences, memoirs of the experience of, I think, hundreds of American GIs who had served in World War II. And of course, the war itself was not good at all. It was bloody, it was horrific, people died, people were injured, and, you know, there was terrible suffering. But the idea was that compared to Vietnam, compared to some of the other wars that the US had got itself into after that time, the US participation in World War II was good in quote marks because it created a narrative of moral purpose that America had stood up and fought against dark forces. So trying to express in a nutshell why China has turned back to its World War II experience, you know, that long war between 1937 and 45 with over 10 million dead, um, 100 million refugees, holding down you know, half a million Japanese troops before Pearl Harbor, all of this has gone to construct a narrative in China today and over the last you know, 20 to 30 years, I'd say, in which China seeks to portray itself to the world as also having taken part in a good war in the sense of a World War II that helped make the world safe for decent forces rather than the forces of the Axis power. So, so that's where that good war idea comes from. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm a huge Studs Terkel fan. As a matter of fact, I went to grad school in Chicago and, and got to meet him once. And uh, Bye down before you, Jody. <laughs> that was a liter literary hero of mine. Um, but moving on, you know, uh, building on that point, um, how does this help, the, well, how is this useful at this time? How does this help China bolster its role on the world stage and as a world power? Or, or is it a more nuanced kind of... Um, you know, argument. It's not nuanced at all. It's very, very plain in your face if you know where to look. And I would say the place to look is more and more evident around the world. So let me give you a specific example. I mean, I think this is a, this is a narrative that actually has a lot of significance for domestic Chinese politics, and perhaps we'll speak about that in a few minutes. But let me take your actual question about the world stage. So just before lockdown, um, which has been, as you probably gathered, rather more continuing here in Europe than I gather it is in Hong Kong and indeed in, in, in mainland China. Um, I was able to fly to Germany in February for the Munich Security Conference, which 
you know, many colleagues here will know, probably having reported on it, is a gathering of those talking about a lot of defense and international geopolitical issues. And it was notable that Foreign Minister of China, Wang Yi, who spoke there as, as a keynote, uh, and, and you know, the conversation between him and Secretary Pompeo and Secretary Esper was not a very friendly one, it has to be, has to be said, no secret about that. Wang Yi brought out a line which we've heard over and over again in the last few years, and certainly from Xi Jinping onwards, you, you hear this, that the world has to remember that amongst other things, China should be regarded as a responsible world actor because it was not just a signatory, but the first signatory in history to the UN Charter at San Francisco in April 1945, which if you look at the document itself is, is technically true. The point that I'm making by bringing this up and the, the, that's being uh, made by this you know, continued statement by today's CCP and People's Republic of China is that China today seeks ownership of the joint foundation of that whole United Nations structure post-1945, which came out of World War II. And just to explain why that's important, 20, 30, no, let's say 30 years ago, there was only one point of origin for the People's Republic of China, and that was 1949. Of course, the victory of Mao, Tiananmen Square, Chinese people have stood up, we, we all know that. And that has not gone away. Anyone who saw the coverage of National Day last year on the 70th anniversary will, will know that's very much part of the narrative. But in addition, another point of origin, 1945, has now been owned, you might say, by the Chinese Communist Party. They also want to say that in terms of the foundation of global order, particularly at a time when it's perceived, let's say, that President Donald Trump is not very keen on that order, that it's really China that was there at the foundation of that 1945 order, and that today China should therefore be entrusted with its development. By the way, uh, just a Dan's fantastic introduction to me, just to make it clear, I am not personally advocating that this is a position that you should necessarily take on trust. I'm saying this is what Beijing says about itself today. And the argument it uses is basically, if America, through blood and treasure and sacrifices in the Pacific and in China, between 1930, whatever, 41 and 45, should have the right 70 years plus on to have this huge military presence in Asia, well, China was there too, China sacrificed too. We also therefore have a moral weight behind us, given through the blood and treasure of our war, World War II sacrifice, that also gives us rights in this region. So it's very much an argument about the present day drawing on that history. Well, on that point, I have a question uh, from Eric Wishart, who's the FCC first vice president and an editor at AFP, uh, who says, as we are discussing rewriting history, what do you think of the way that other major World War II combatants, Russia, the US, Britain, Germany, Japan, uh, portray the war today and how close is that to reality? How have those narratives changed over the years or are they pretty close to reality? Eric, great question. And I would say that the answer I'd give for all countries is that every single one of their World War II narratives is based on something that has real resonance and real fact behind it. In other words, it's not simply a propaganda production that has no basis in reality, but also every single country adapts it in a way that suits its own needs and narratives of the moment. In a sense, none of this is history. It's all current affairs. So, I mean, to give one example to, I suspect the, we've got at least a few Brits on the, um, on the call, I can see a few oh, names. Oh, I'm up. sure a few, yeah. <laughs> uh, I recognize, you know, I'm looking at the, part of the attendees list, which is a magic of Zoom. I can see uh, at least the, the supposed names of people involved, and I can see quite a few uh, Brit, uh, Brit friends there. So, you know, those who keep an eye on Britain or are coming back to Britain will know that, first of all, through Brexit and then through COVID-19, World War II metaphors have been throwing themselves, you know, over the deck at every single moment. In fact, our current Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is very keen to put himself in Winston Churchill mode on a frequent basis, and he has written a biography of him. Now, to be fair, I don't think Prime Minister Johnson is suggesting that he is Winston Churchill. People are not suggesting that COVID is the Blitz. But the point is that it provides an immediate fount of metaphor. I mean, even the Queen at the height of the COVID crisis in Britain used that phrase, we'll meet again, from Vera Lynn's famous wartime song. So, you know, you just have to turn to Britain as one country, you know, democratic, liberal, very different from China in, in most ways, which also draws on that, uh, on that background. And I think for, for, for Russia, again, you have, I mean, I think they've gone further than China in that I believe it's now a criminal offense to commit libel, at least in the eyes of the Russian courts, against the memory of World War II, which could include, you know, include almost, almost anything one, uh, one imagines. In the case of China, I think, you know, to get to the heart of why this nostalgia has been so powerful, 
it's a very clever mixture. And I don't mean clever in a kind of sinister sense. I mean, actually, in, in a sense, it, it's been quite well thought through because it allows space to breathe as well as a kind of propaganda effort, which combines very, very blatant top-down um, expressions of nationalism. So the example comes to mind is the Tiananmen Square the, uh, parade back in 2015 with tanks and guns and, and all of that, along with some more subtle signaling. So right in the middle of that parade, which many here will have covered or seen on television or el elsewhere, in the middle, you have that moment where Xi Jinping had presented to him, I think, four veterans of the communist armies against the Japanese and four Guomindang nationalist veterans, aged at that point between 90 and 102, if I remember correctly. And the point was that for anyone who knows China, as this audience does, it was a very important gesture of reconciliation without ever saying, OK, we were too harsh on Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists and actually these people had a role too, by presenting those veterans, a statement was made about why China today should be overcoming some of those fissures that uh, were supposed to have healed over. I would point out just as a final rider to that note though, that as you will have seen, the war that everyone's talking about right this week in China is the Korean War, or as it's known in China, of course, Kang Mei, resistance to America. I will leave it to this expert audience to uh, divine what the present day message might be about that particular historical commemoration. Um, on, the, on the issue of messaging, so China obviously is well known for controlling messaging in most all arenas and for censoring and using state-controlled media as propaganda organs. Um, do you see this as becoming more stringent under the current administration, under, current, under uh, Xi Jinping? And how does this play into the thesis of your book and, and your previous books? So I think the short answer is yes. And let me give a slightly more nuanced answer to explain where nonetheless, I think there are some interesting currents of pushback going on um, as well. So in an absolute sense, I think it is, you know, it's not possible to argue other than that within mainland China itself, as well as of course more recently in Hong Kong, as we know, new laws, new legislations, a new exercise of existing laws, which are being pushed much harder, is making it much harder to do the kind of in-depth investigative reporting that even 10 years or so ago we saw from newspapers like the uh, Nanfang Zhou Mo, the Southern Weekend, which did a lot of really important investigative work. It's not completely absent, as, as you will know, but it's now much, much harder to, to do that. So in an absolute sense, there are clearly restrictions and constraints now that weren't there before, even in the context of China's very controlled media. But one of the things that I hope people might um, find interesting, and as I say, the book is easily available if uh, those who want to, uh, uh, to, to have a go with it, is that sometimes you can find ways in which people's feelings in the wider public sphere and people's feelings in terms of issues that are important to them at the grassroots can actually push back against state propaganda. Let me give you an example of, of what I mean there, because it relates to actually one of China's most famous journalists. Um, well, I'm, I'm talking about um, uh, Cui Yongyuan, uh, who of course was a big chat show host in China, talk show host, I should say, for maybe 10, 15 years. He's now not working so much in, in, in media. And I think famously he and Fang Bingbing have uh, fallen out big time over various, uh, various issues. But the thing is he was a major voice in the Chinese TV sphere. Now he's pursued many, many projects over the years, but the one that I concentrate on in the book is uh, Wada Kang Zha, my one person's war of resistance, my war of resistance, in which he started off doing an authorized program. If I remember correctly, it was about the, the, the Eighth Rood Army, the, Chinese uh, communist armed forces during World War II, very mainstream authorized topic, and kept on running across nationalist Kuomintang veterans, who of course were on the right side in World War II, but then the wrong side in the Civil War. And he kept hearing, you know, these elderly men, the stories, you know, we were never acknowledged for what we did. We didn't get pensions. We're living in poverty. You know, I can't bear to think of my comrades because I'll burst tears. So he started filming all this stuff. And, you know, the Chinese TV authorities said, no, no, I'm not putting this on screen. But in the age of social media, they're fine. They just put it up on Yoku, put it on Tudo, and everyone's watching it. And eventually, thanks to that social media insertion of that story into the national narrative in China, actually did get a mainstream terrestrial TV showing uh, uh, eventually. But also, of course, that question of Kuomintang veterans getting their pensions and so forth has become a much more mainstream issue in China itself. And that was, as I say, not because the state wanted it to be so. I mean, if they had a choice, they probably would have rather forgotten about it. But because citizens were able to use the kind of space that does exist in the media to try and push back on certain stories, particularly when they have that patriotic nationalist background to them as this one did.
Let's see. Well, we have a question here um, from uh, Anthony Daprian, who's our, on our uh, professional committee that helps plan the events. He says, the latest Pew survey show China's global reputation plunging to historic lows. How do you think China responds to this? Might it lead to some moderating of their, their so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, or is the audience primarily domestic, and does China really not care what the global community thinks? So I've seen some of those stats actually in the news this morning and over the last day or so, and uh, the figure for the UK where I'm sitting now, I think was I think 76% uh, negative towards China, I think 83% in the US, about 80% in Germany. Um, so two things to say. The first is to say, I would like to see more figures from countries that are not in the West on this, uh, because I think it's fair to say that the US and Western Europe are having a very bad moment with China. China is having a bad moment with, with them. In Sub-Saharan Africa, in Latin America, I think the numbers that I've seen from late 2019 tend to be more favorable, partly because of um, financial investment. So Belt just remind us, yeah. absolutely, Belt Road. But you know, the point is that the world is not just the Western world, even though that's, right. that's important. So but very good said, point. But, but having said that, let's address the, the particular point, because it's a really important one. My sense, and it's only a sense from looking from outside, is that actually there's quite a bit of pushback in China about the whole Janlan, the, uh, the wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, which I think was, you know, it still has plenty of things, elements to it, but the real peak was actually, co not coincidentally, I think during the peak of the pandemic in, in spring when, you know, voices were really you know, shouting loudly with very little nuance at all. And my sense is that public statements by figures such as Tui Kian Kai, the uh, Chinese ambassador to the US, who I think actually literally said in public that one of his foreign ministry colleagues was talking nonsense. And I think some more measured statements from a uh, former, uh, former ambassador and now vice foreign minister Fu Ying saying, you know, maybe need to just calm the language down. This isn't helping China's case. Suggests not, I think, a 50-50 split. I'd be very surprised if that was the case. But there is at least some stream within Chinese diplomacy, which does understand that this has been really damaging to China's reputation. And actually, Anyone who thinks that it's been part of some kind of great wider thought through propaganda effort, I think needs to look at the results of it. Six months ago, it looks, no, not six months, but let's say a year ago, it looked quite likely that the UK might accept uh, Huawei um, 5G into its um, uh, telecom system. For whatever reason, that's not now going to, uh, going to happen. India, you know, not a friend of China really, but was seriously looking at should they take that Huawei provision on the grounds mm -hmm. that it's cheap and it will you know, rev up India's economy. I would be very surprised in the basis of the, the clash in the Himalayas as to whether or not India would now do that. I, mean, I have you know, no inside knowledge, but it just seems to me that if you were actually kind of sitting in Beijing plotting and planning, you would not do the things that have happened, which as we say in, in Britain, tends to be suggest cock up rather than conspiracy in that. Uh, <laughs> in that uh, so I, I, I think that there has been a perception that this has gone, um, gone badly. And the thing that I think might just might lead to a bit, not a certainly 180 degree turn, but maybe a 90 degree turn, is that the other figures that Pew has also put out, and also the Ash Center at uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard, is that domestic satisfaction with the CCP over COVID is pretty high. And, you know, this group of people has either been in person or seen the images. Everyone's going on Golden Week holidays on public transit. Uh, you know, people are wandering around to restaurants. They're doing stuff that I can tell you we're not doing here in Britain at the, at the moment. The reasons for that politically good or bad, we can discuss and debate. But the fact is that I think China's now in a position where at home, it's got a reasonable amount of security, at least with the core population. It's got a very bad reputation in the global north. So it's gonna have to start from there in terms of rethinking where do they go now? Well, let's talk a little bit about the pandemic. And you know, though the coronavirus emerged in Wuhan and China has been roundly criticized for, being, uh, for not being open at first, um, the messaging now is clear that they took aggressive steps, halted the outbreak. It's the first major country to successfully emerge from the virus and the first to get its economy fully reopened. Uh, first, do you buy this messaging or do you think it's overly nationalistic, it's overly programmed? And what happens if there are other waves of the virus, which obviously they've been around the world, including right here in Hong Kong, right next door to China, where we've had a you know, pretty uh, good pandemic, is <laughs> using the title of your book. Um, it hasn't been too bad here. You know, are there risks inherent in China's messaging on the pandemic? Well, you say good pandemic, and I would point out, actually, I think uh, in the last part of, uh, of China's good war, uh, I was able to publish it in time to get in the first 
uses by the Chinese government of World War II metaphors about oh. fighting COVID. In fact, the uh, Renmin Zhanzhong, the People's War Against the Virus, which was, you know, for anyone who's read Mao's works, a very familiar uh, phrasing. So, you know, World War II can do all sorts of good work for you. you <laughs> That's send good. Out a, send out a message. But thinking more about the pandemic side of things, I think that one of the few analogies or messages that so far the world can learn about comparative performance on the pandemic is that there is no consistent message, by which I mean the following. If you think about the list of countries which have done well on the pandemic in terms of control and domestic population, and you know, China is on that list, from all accounts, so is Hong Kong, uh, fair enough. Um, but you know, other places that have done really well are very varied in their regime type. You want to call you know, New Zealand the regime. New Zealand, Greece, Taiwan, South Korea, Germany, you know, what do these have, countries have in common? Well, uh, Vietnam, another very good example there, in fact, uh, as, uh, as well. So in that sense, I think simplistic messages about governmental type being uh, the uh, reason that things have gone well or badly simply won't do on their, uh, on their own. So on the one hand, if China uses the argument that only an authoritarian society can possibly clamp down on the virus, then actually I think that that clearly doesn't uh, follow. On the other hand, you know, if liberals like me want to make the argument that actually only democracies can do it, well then again, the China aside, you have to go over to Vietnam and start asking questions about why has their rate been so, uh, so, uh, so low. So I think there's still clearly a great deal more to find out about the virology of it. And one of the things that I would say, and this is a line that's still being drawn, and we don't know where it's gonna go, which is this. The question of scientific research in labs is already sensitive and it's gonna become more so. And this is gonna be a great story for journalists. If it isn't already, it's gonna be in the near future. Because I think one of the things you will know if you go to any research lab, certainly in the UK, and that would include Oxford, is that a very large proportion of the best and the brightest are Chinese citizens. And they're Chinese citizens working in British universities. Until recently, they've been working in US universities too. Um, I am the first to say that there are all sorts of security issues between the US and China, and that China does not shamefully allow the kind of access to US researchers and journalists and others, journalists in particular in this, this um, conversation, we should shout out that the US does even now to the Chinese equivalents. But nonetheless, the creating of what seems to be a very hostile atmosphere to Chinese scientific research and academics more broadly, including social scientists, I think has been very counterproductive for the US. And when we go to the question of actually where the next set of discoveries are going to come from in terms of the science, I think a message that is simply nationalistic, and China does this too, it wants to suggest that Chinese research is going to beat COVID. And actually, of course, it won't. Scientific research is going to do that. And working across boundaries is going to be more, not less important. I just don't think that in this nationalistic age, any of these countries has yet worked out precisely how they're actually going to do it. We have a question here from uh, Richard Ward, an uh, absent member who's now in the US, who asks um, a question that I think a lot of people have on their minds is um, the election, US elections less than a month away. How could a new democratic um, administration in the US uh, work with China to try to build US-China cooperation uh, to rebuild dialogue and cooperation between the two countries? And what can we learn from, from World War II, perhaps, uh, in, in this? So kind of two questions there, I guess. But they're related questions, and they're, 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 they're good ones. Thank you for that. Um, so I would say that there's going to be, I think, a very clear fork in the road, depending on who gets elected in a month's time, whether on the third or at some point fairly soon after that. Um, my sense is that it will be you know, if we have the Trump administration, I think we're going to go further down the route that we are now, which is a huge amount of very confrontational rhetoric on both sides. I mean, you know, people talk about Trump's um, aggressive rhetoric. I think that's true. China has been responding a lot in the wolf warrior mode, as we've also said. So both of these things have to be um, acknowledged. But I think it's going to be easier, I suspect, for a Biden administration to come up with a not solution, at least a new way of addressing this while not ducking away from the problems. Uh, that uh, involve dealing with a large, growing, authoritarian, powerful economy in the shape of, of China. But I think the key word is probably consistency. The reason I say that is this. Many people in you know, Western Europe, for instance, are also worried about China and its growing role. You know, why is its military growing? Why is uh, China uh, you know, ch choosing to 
uh, uh, close down its internal politics in the way that uh, in the way that it is. What's happening in, in Hong Kong? These are all very uh, valid questions that people want to ask and don't feel so far they've got answers for. But the problem is that because the leading nation of the free world, the United States, is currently putting itself in a mode where it seems to be saying, we don't really do alliances anymore. We don't really respect that post-1945 world order anymore. And, you know, it is very much our way or the highway. That is um, something that is clearly very problematic to a lot of uh, countries in Europe. I mean, we mentioned the Pew research uh, on China, which suggests you know, dire negative numbers in pretty much every advanced economy uh, in terms of China's favorability. But look at the numbers for the United States in Germany. At least at one point recently, more respondents said that they trusted China than they trusted the United States in Germany. So, you know, there is clearly an awful lot of PR work to be done by whoever gets back in the White House uh, in a few weeks time. But the Biden administration, if there is one, would be able, I think, to pick up the phone you know, to the EU. Uh, it will be able to talk to London, which of course is no longer in the EU, but is very much a country that's going to be part of that, um, uh, that ecosystem. You know, talk to Japan, talk to South Korea, you know, all the people who for 75 years have been part of that wider ecosystem of shared norms and liberal norms, in, in, in most of those cases, South Korea too, and actually say, let's talk about how we do this together. And in doing that, you can then actually have a more nuanced conversation rather than, you know, everything coming out of the mouth of the president of the US saying that China is, you know, essentially a, a malevolent actor with nothing going for it whatsoever. The things that people say almost as sort of shibboleths, but actually need substance behind them, the climate change conversation, the conversation actually about working together on development in the global south. You know, there's a reason those numbers for China are higher in sub-Saharan Africa. That's because even if there's a lot of problems with Chinese um, aid and assistance, it does actually exist in many places where it doesn't otherwise. Also really interesting security questions around places like Pakistan, which need to be talked about, but don't get talked about very much. I think those are conversations that a Biden administration after a, something of a reset can have at the same time as saying, we in the Western world also have X, Y, Z red lines about what happens with your growth in the region and the world to, to China, um, because they can, they can essentially put together a, a, a consistent line. So that I think is where a difference might lie, assuming that he gets elected, which of course has not yet happened. No, we may not know for a while <laughs> who is the Very president. True. Um, um, well, on to Hong Kong, since you mentioned Hong Kong. So you wrote an opinion piece for Al Jazeera a little more than a year ago uh, in yep. August 2019, uh, when the protests were still raging and the thesis with the thesis that Beijing had to um, should be positively engaging politically with mm. Hong Kong, uh, and uh, the protesters uh, with their liberal values were central, not marginal, to what makes Hong Kong distinctive and also what makes it Chinese. Yeah. Uh, in the years since you wrote this, we've seen a very different turn of events, with the yep. unrest getting more violent, more virulently anti-China. And then in recent months, uh, China's clamped down with the national security law, stifling a number of freedoms, including academic. Uh, what would you write in an op-ed now about Hong Kong vis-a-vis uh, -vis China? And what would you advise Chinese officials, if they called upon you to do so, to do now, given Hong Kong? Well, I'm glad to say the likelihood of any Chinese official calling up some random historian in the UK and asking his opinion or her opinion is pretty much close to zero. So I think I'm safe on that, uh, uh, on that point. Well, you I never have, know. <laughs> um, I have actually written on this and related questions actually quite regularly in your hometown paper, the South China Morning Post. And, uh, you know, op-eds under my name are uh, available there for anyone who'd like to, to take them up. So please do... Uh, do have a look at some of those. In particular, I did write one piece a little while ago, actually, on the question, which talked about the similarities between Hong Kong and Northern Ireland, which is not a connection that is, nor that is always made. But actually, the weird thing is that they're both places within one proud sovereign country, China or the UK, where actually United Nations treaties have put certain constraints in terms of the uh, host countries sovereignty. It sounds a bit specific, but actually there are some interesting parallels, uh, parallels there. I won't talk about that now because people can go and read the, the, the op-ed. In, in answer to your, uh, to your question, I think here is, here is something that I haven't yet heard a very good answer to, and I speak obviously, and I should say this first of all, as someone who lives in the UK, I visit Hong Kong as often as I can. I hope I'll come many times, but I'm not a Hong Konger. I don't live in Hong Kong, and therefore I'm very cognizant that those who live and work in Hong Kong must have 
the last word in terms of you know what should be done. There's nothing more annoying than kind of foreigners coming from outside saying you should do this or you should do that. But it seems to me that at the moment, all sides involved, the power relationship is not equal, but there's there's one thing they've got in common. So the power relationship is not equal because clearly you know Beijing and the forces behind the Hong Kong government are powerful. They have both legal power, coercive power, military power, all those sorts of, uh, of things. And those who you know have the power of the vote when the elections are actually held um, or of being able to speak out, nonetheless are more vulnerable. So I think that's just a clear imbalance of power. And you know it's a factual statement. I think nobody nobody could possibly dispute uh, that. But where I think there is a commonality is that it's still not clear from the outside what the various interest groups involved want to happen. And this is as true, I think, for those protesting as it is for those upholding what they would portray as being you know, the, the current uh, status quo. In other words, you know, what is Hong Kong supposed to look like in five years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, and all the way up to 2047? Um, the reason, if I remember what I wrote a year ago or so, that I was puzzled, well, perhaps I shouldn't be puzzled, but I should say that, is that it seems to me that the Hong Kong authorities, even now, have plenty of opportunities to actually say, what they think their vision of Hong Kong is, bearing in mind, as they say frequently, that the basic law, you know, is still going to be there, that the level of openness on elections, on the judicial system, and all of this is supposed to stay entirely intact and in place. You know, this is something that the authorities reassure people on, on a regular basis. So having that conversation in which that gets detail put on it and saying, what exactly does this mean in the context of the NSL and what's happening now, are really, really important things to, to hear. So far, I mean, I may be missing out and I'd be very happy for people to you know, send me the, the information. I haven't heard clear, positive, optimistic, engaged statements by those in a wider sense, you know, in the leadership positions in Hong Kong to really make that clear. And that seems to be odd on the grounds that it's the easiest thing in the world to do. You know, you have a prosperous first world city which has, you know, a world-class infrastructure, uh, levels of control have now been clearly through the, the new laws uh, brought uh, together in the city. So, you know, where's the next stage of the story? You know, what are we supposed to hear, uh, uh, hear next? And so far, as I say, that story has not been articulated in any way that's, that's very clear to the outside uh, world. But I'd be delighted to be proved wrong. You know, maybe, you know, that, that, that big speech, that big op-ed or something is, is, is coming, uh, coming right now and we'll all have to, to listen out for it. Next two questions are from Christy Lou Stout with CNN and a member of the FCC Board of Governors. And her first question is something you've mentioned a few times, but it would be good to get a um, more specific perspective on this, is what your thoughts are on the so-called wolf warriors, the aggressive new breed of Chinese diplomats. What gave rise to the style of diplomacy and will forceful posturing translate into more forceful action and reaction in your view? The reasons, uh, well, nice to hear from you, uh, Christian, uh, although we haven't met, of course, uh, like many, I know your work from, uh, from CNN, so it's great to, uh, to have your, your question there. Um, so what then is the answer to why this form of very kind of um, confrontational diplomatic language has been used? I think there are probably a variety of reasons. And, you know, I privately asked quite a number of people involved with Chinese foreign policy in a broader sense where it comes from. And the reasons that I get given, some of which are, you know, I think, more plausible than, than others, are, are as follows. First of all, I think Chinese political language, and I think probably the majority of people on this call do speak Chinese, but maybe not, not everyone, but you know, a lot of people will know that. It's very different from English language usage. I mean, all sorts of different languages have their, their different ways, I think, of engaging with politics. But if you think about all those uh, koha and biaoti and these sorts of phrases, you know, the way that people sometimes make fun of the fact that communist um, Chinese uh, kind of work plans always have sort of seven points or five points or 17 points or whatever it might be, all of which actually comes in part, I think, from uh, uh, models that come more from Confucian rational bureaucracy than they do necessarily from uh, communist uh, practice. But direct translation of all this stuff just into English, I think is often it just sounds very, very grating on an Anglophone ear. And I think even for brilliant, fluent speakers of, of English, of which there are many in the Chinese diplomatic uh, service, there isn't perhaps the kind of native speaker ability to hear quite how it comes over in a way that I think is also true with even foreigners who speak much more fluent Mandarin than, than I do, or perhaps in, except in a few cases, never have 
absolutely the kind of clear on uh, you know feeling on, uh, as to how a particular statement goes down. Dashan maybe does, but you know there aren't that many others I think who uh, are in that um, in that position. So I think the importance of language as language, you know, in terms of literal translation, shouldn't be underestimated. But in addition to that, I think that a lot of it has to do with this difficulty in balancing something that's happened within the last, ooh, I don't know, let's say five to 10 years, but certainly let's say since you know, the, the Xi Jinping speech to Congress in 2017, which is about China going global and becoming a global power. And again, it's become, you know, it's a sort of kohal in its own right, you know, the idea China goes global. There's a great book actually by David Chamble, the political scientist under that, that title, which I, I, I recommend. But actually the implications of what that means for China have not been fully thought through, I think, at the policy making level. Because countries that actually aspire to global leadership, and the US is a really good example here, find that therefore they are being surveilled in real time on a global level. If you wanted to be more cynical than I would want to, uh, to be normally, you could say that, let's say 30 years ago, uh, when you know, China complained about human rights abuses within China being picked up by foreigners, the argument could be used that this is an internal matter of China, it's absolutely none of your business. We still hear that, of, of course. And there was an argument, you know, perhaps a Westphalian one, that, well, if China is doing X, Y, and Z behind its own internationally recognized borders, we don't like it, but you know, that's, that's their business. I personally would say that we should not do that. I think there are universal values, but you could see the, the logical argument for it. But there is no argument for a country to basically state outright that its project is to create a tech ecology which can spread across the world, to forward a project like BRI, which combines security, geopolitical and economic elements that involves huge amounts of involvement with the world's uh, politics. And also, of course, to take, as they should do, a full and responsible role at the United Nations, but then say that nothing that we do at home in terms of values has any relevance. And when the United States tried this back in the day in the 50s and 60s by saying, we are the leaders of the world's greatest democracy, but nobody can tell us what to do with our African-American citizens. Well, it wasn't just the African-American citizens who said, actually, guys, you know, this doesn't fly. And it was, of course, Chairman Mao himself who invited uh, various figures, including Henry Louis Gates Jr. and I think Q.P. Newton later on to uh, Beijing uh, to visit. So in those days, clearly interfering in uh, America's racial politics was something that China was not reluctant to, uh, to do. In other words, I think the growing pains of realizing that going global means that everyone's looking at you all the time, 24 seven, and you have to engage with what they say, not just keep screaming and shouting, is a lesson that's still being learned. But as I said from my earlier comments, there's an indication at least in some parts, it seems to me of the foreign policy establishment, that there's a realization that just throwing tantrums is not going to be enough. There has to be a more rational discussion with the world about what China's project really is. Well, and, I, and uh, Christy's second question, do you fear that the current China-US tensions, especially given this new style of diplomacy and an equally tough style on the US side, could escalate into a deadly clash? I mean, clearly the current military buildup in the East Asia region is one, like any military buildup, that has the potential to be dangerous. I personally still don't think that it is the most likely outcome by a long way, but I think the likelihood at the moment that there is going to be a greater drawing up of lines between countries that are comfortable being closer to China and ones that are not is going to accelerate quite, uh, quite strongly. And I think that one of the things that Chinese diplomacy has so far not really managed to work out very successfully is how far it wants to use sugar and how far it wants to use vinegar in these sorts of, of areas. I mean, a country like South Korea, which sits, you know, in the middle, important, economically hugely important, you know, powerful democracy, but with a very strong trading relationship with China. And the question, you know, can be asked over, over time, is the China that South Korea has to deal with the one that, you know, basically provides solidarity on the forced sex workers, comfort women, a so-called issue, uh, which China has been very strong on, or is it the China that basically launches a soft boycott of South Korean economic products because of uh, the acceptance of the fad missile defense system. And this, you know, makes it very difficult, I think, for countries in the region that want to have a good relationship with China to know where they stand. The Trump administration, I think, has been a great blessing to China on this part because it's, if not alienated, at least made nervous so many of its 
theoretical allies in the region, that actually Beijing has been able to portray itself as a country that sits perhaps more in the kind of middle of those discussions. But as I was saying, if there is a Biden administration and if it's able to actually rally traditional allies around it, I think that Beijing will no longer have that sort of blanket to cover it. And, you know, in the unlikely event that anyone in Beijing would be, uh, you know, wanted to have outsiders advising on this, they need to be thinking now about how they're actually going to present a diplomatic face to the region and to the wider world that other people will appreciate. Because as we've been saying, those opinion poll numbers on China's favorability look very, very poor at the moment. Well, we have a couple more questions here. One from uh, Agnes Chong, who asks, uh, how should the world respond to China's increasing th threats toward Taiwan while also taking into account the will of the Taiwan people? And obviously, this is an area where um, when we talk about those um, potential uh, foreign policy and, and uh, militaristic issues, uh, Taiwan often is uh, at the top of the list. It very much is. And I think one of the things that, again, I've written in a, an op-ed piece, and we're happy to have people look that up, is that one way of trying to get to the question is to flip it the other way in a way that doesn't often get done, I think. And I've, I've directly asked this to people involved with the Chinese diplomacy, which is, what's your offer to Taiwan? You talk about the need for reunification, peaceful or non-peaceful, whatever it might be. But what's the story you're telling that is about the fact that Taiwan has you know, 23 million people, lively liberal democracy, all those sorts of uh, sorts of uh, aspects, which you know, presumably are going to have to be be preserved. What then is Beijing's statement that you should be reunified with us and it was to be great for you because X, Y, Z? And you know the answers that I've heard have usually been on the rise as well. You know, not looking to change too much, which it isn't really. So in a sense, it's a version of the question about Hong Kong, which is where is Beijing actually telling a narrative? A story that can actually bring people in. This has been a big problem, of course, the Trump administration has had. I mean, it's a very different sort of society, don't get me wrong, I'm not equivocating, equivalent, making equivalents of the, of the two. But, you know, the US, which has had this incredibly attractive narrative for so much of the world, despite its flaws and hypocrisies and all of that, for 75 years, has lost huge amounts of that credit in the last um, four years because of the behavior of the current administration. Now, if you flip that round and apply it to, to Beijing, that wider issue, I mean, anyone who's been to China will know that Chinese policymakers are obsessed with soft power. And the idea of how do you get people to do what you want because you, they want to, not just because you want them to. And I think being able to come up with a really good narrative on Taiwan, on Hong Kong, and all of these sorts of issues would be at the heart of, uh, of that. So that's a challenge that I'll, I'll, I'll throw out. A question here from um, FCC member Lucy Callback. Uh, given the CCP's uh, is in her, this is her question, inability to recognize the nationalistic contribution to China's eventual victory in World War II. How does China deal with the allied and especially American contribution to uh, victory in its narrative? Hi, Lucy. Good to, good to hear from you. Uh, Lucy and I have known each other for quite a few times since we, uh, quite a few years since we studied Mandarin together at uh, Cambridge. Oh, oh very nice. Today. But Lucy's gone mm. to much more exciting places and things than I have. Mm -hmm. So the United States is one of the missing factors in China's version of its World War II narrative that has sort of come back over time. If you sort of say that, let's say, 40 years ago, the only version of this story that could be talked about in the context of um, uh, the, the, the history of, of, of China's involvement in the war against Japan was the leading role of the Chinese Communist Party, and that's you know, still very much there. But over the last 30, 40 years, various different other factors of, you know, like sort of strings and then brass coming into an orchestra, slowly been brought into the narrative. So, as I mentioned before, the Kuomintang nationalists now very much to the, the, the heart of that particular story. And then beyond that, you also have the bringing back of the allies. So the British and, of course, the United States, who, of course, both financially and in terms of their uh, uh, air support and so forth, were a very important part of that wartime, uh, wartime victory. But I would say, actually, just you know, finishing off on that thought, too, back, back to Lucy and, uh, and others, something that I think still does give us more pause for thought, or should give us more pause for thought than we've had on this, is that even when you bring back in the, the American factor, which of course was crucial to winning the Pacific War, it still brings up the central point that the Chinese themselves make, and I think with some justification on this, which is that 
but the Americans weren't fighting on the ground in China. You know, that war and that holding back of those half million plus Japanese troops was being done by Chinese troops, nationalist and communist. The Ch Chinese also actually did join with the Americans and the British in Burma to fight against the Japanese there as well. It was the one expedition that went uh, across the, uh, uh, the borders. So bringing the Americans back into the story is something that has been done, particularly in the old wartime capital at Chongqing, where the house of General Joe Stilwell, you know, the American commander in chief of, of Chiang Kai-shek's uh, army, uh, had his old house restored and it's there as a, as a museum uh, today. And that story is not ignored, I think, anymore. I mean, now there are very few left and they're too old to travel. But 20 years ago, quite a few American veterans of you know, the Flying Tigers and even the kind of non-combatant ground troops would come and visit the, uh, the house then. But in the current climate, I think it's fair to say that because of US-China relations, the American role in the war is probably being downplayed more than might have been the case perhaps a few years ago. Speaking of Japan, um, how do you see re China's relationship with Japan, which was warming up somewhat uh, with Abe, at least a lot warmer than it had been, but now that uh, uh, there's going to be a change in leadership, how is that going to, do you think, affect that relationship? And you know, does it doesn't matter much in the world anymore. Sorry, you mean the U.S.-China relationship, uh, Jody? Or no, the, no, Japan-China. Japan-China. Yeah, China China. Does, does yeah. Japan-China matter much besides to Japan and China in terms of trade? Well, it does matter a great deal because um, despite all the kind of ups and downs, uh, both of the countries are linked into a whole variety of security as well as economic questions that are going to be tested, I think, quite hard in the next few years. And again, there's a question, you know, perhaps it's not quite fair to call Mr. Suga a caretaker prime minister, but he certainly is sort of an interim figure until he has the LDP chooses the, uh, the next, uh, next year incumbent. Right. I think it's fair to say that China-Japan relations will always be important, and clearly, you know, World War II was a very different sort of, uh, sort of time, but it did show that when that, that whole region that you're sitting in goes up in smoke, the rest of the world you know, suffers from that as well. It cannot be contained, particularly in the current era when you've got the world's second and third biggest economy close to, uh, to, to each other. But I think it's also fair to say that broadly speaking, in the last few years, China-Japan relations have cooled off. I mean, you know, it is, uh, I'm cooled off in the sense of not being about to explode. Uh, in 2013, 2014, there was huge amounts of fear that the islands dispute, Senkaku Yayu Islands, halfway between the two countries, was going to actually, you know, burst out into all out um, confrontation. I don't think that that seems to be what people think is likely at the moment, although the number of potential clashes between Japanese and Chinese troops and aircraft just outside the island uh, uh, boundaries is still worrying to uh, to see. I think it is the case that if there were to be a Biden administration, the current U uh, J Japanese government would be likely to want to make sure that what well, has been a somewhat, I could put it, fractious relationship, even with between Abe and Trump, is mended. And I suspect that, of course, one of the first things that the Biden administration would try and do is to get the CPTPP back on track with the United States involved. Since those of you who follow Brexit matters will know that apparently Britain is now going to reinsert itself as a Pacific power and join the CPTPP as well. We're all coming to get you as well. And I think the Japanese, from what I gather, having just signed a, a trade agreement actually with the UK in the last few weeks, is quite up for that uh, as well. So there should could be some interesting geopolitical shifting coming in the next few months, Jen. Well, we have another Japan question. This is from uh, Kenji uh, Kawasi uh, from Nikkei. Uh, he asks, will there be a time when Beijing stops using World War II history in its relationship with Japan? Will it move past that? And if that is to happen, what would be the conditions? Thanks, Kenji. Um, so in the book, I, I say two things about that. The first one is that I don't think that it is very likely, I'm afraid, that China is going to stop using that issue, partly because it's not really about the history of the issue. It's about putting forward certain uh, political aims, particularly internationally, that China wants to pursue, as, as long as it can argue that Japan is not really a, a safe, peaceful actor in the, in the region, which obviously it is, um, I, I, I think that they will continue to pick at that particular, uh, particular sort. But the good news, and I think it is good news, and this is actually a more important argument of, of, of the book, is that obviously for sitting in Japan, it's very trying to you know, see that uh, um, this historical issue keeps coming up again. Although I must say, the Japanese right wing does not do itself any favors by continuing to be very, very 
ambivalent about the level of uh, you know, sensor seeking the war responsibility uh, uh, question. So I think you have to you know, look at what, what's happening on, on, on both sides. But overall, most of China's continuing fixation on World War II, and I do think that it is something that, as I say, is not going away in any wider sense. You know, as I said, hit movies, hit TV series, uh, social media discussions, quotations of the, the UN Foundation 1945 at the Munich Security Conference, whatever it might be. The vast majority of these are not really about China's relationship with Japan at all. They're really about the way that China thinks about itself. And the one thing I will say briefly, because I think I have, perhaps I've made this point quite clearly enough, and I'll, I'll do it now, is that I think the central reason that actually China continues to come back to these different interpretations of the war is that it fills a particular sort of hole. It fills a hole in the current sort of public sphere and wider psychology in China, which is that China has become richer, it's become peaceful, it's become stable, all the things that it wasn't 50, 70, 100 years ago. And those things have come through a variety of means. But what it doesn't have is a sort of moral project at its core. I mean, yes, you have poverty reduction, which of course is very important. And you know, this wider idea of trying to use BRI as a means of thinking about Chinese development. But actually that idea, which World War II still provides for lots and lots of different countries, including, as I've said, Britain, that it was this sort of existential moment when the back was against the wall and people fought back against the outside invader and won. That still has lots and lots of resonance for people who wouldn't know one end of a rifle from another, even though it was put in, in, in front of them. So to that extent, I think that actually that element of China's use of World War II will be with us for a very long time to come. But as I say, the good news, it's not really about Japan at all. It's much more about what China thinks about itself. Um, well, here's my second to last question, and then I have a quick one at the end where we, that we ask everybody. But this is, what do you think the top risk for China domestically is? Uh, is it climate change? Is it the economy difficulties opening up? Is it the aging demographic and the relatively low birth rate? Um, or is it perhaps the pandemic and, and what the pandemic could still bring? There are lots of things, I mean, I, I would say overall, I don't see at the moment any big factors in China that are existential, as long as China doesn't do anything to bring an existential crisis on itself, you know, like a confrontation with the US, I and mean, that would be horrific for both sides, but I don't think either side actually will do that or, or wants that. So in terms of the kind of slow but sure uh, progression of the factors that you're talking uh, about, I find myself coming back over and over again to inequality. I think one of the things, if you look at what really gets people, you know, sort of riled up, it's a feeling that even though overall, broadly speaking, on average, everyone's richer than they were, you know, X number of decades ago, even now, and even after the anti-corruption campaigns and all of that, the gap, not just in terms of money, but in terms of opportunities, in terms of mobility, all those questions between the very poorest and the very richest is still very visible in China. And you know, things like the Foucault system make it uh, visible uh, uh, as well. And I think it's no surprise that therefore poverty reduction, reduction of inequality, and trying to reform the Foucault system are three of the kind of major problems on the desks of China's leaders now and have been for decades and decades. Addressing those, I think, would go a long way to dealing with some of the pressures domestically that are definitely there at the moment. Well, thank you. Well, here's um, our last question, and we compile these uh, online. So uh, we really like your idea. Besides your own book, what have you been reading this fall? Well, and the is answer there is something no, on this topic or something else entirely. No, 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 ab ab lots of wonderful things. But I'd say that I've been reading far too much because actually I've been a judge on not one for two book prizes this uh, uh, this summer, which is um, you know an opportunity to read in all sorts of fantastic um, areas. Uh, and we don't have, fortunately for you, the time for me to list all the great books. But I'll literally just reach behind me since I can see it on my pile there and show you one book. Great. Uh, my professional <laughs> colleague at Cambridge University, uh, Rul Sterks, Professor of Chinese Philosophy and Ancient Chinese Thinks there. Chinese Thought, if you want to read someone who actually knows what they're talking about and talk, telling you about Sun Tzu, Confucius, uh, and all of these great thinkers of the past in a way that's both accessible but very scholarly, that is a wonderful book. So I must say I learned a great deal from Rul's book uh, there and I highly uh, recommend it. Along, of course, with Chinese Good War, which is available <laughs> at all good bookstores and some bad ones as well. 
<laughs> All right. Anything non-scholarly? You know, a novel, short stories, poetry, anything? Uh, oh, uh, yes, no, literary types. No, no, pl pl plenty of plenty of things along those uh, uh, along those uh, those lines uh, uh, as well. So I think probably looking at the uh, the, 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 the pile that I've got uh, over there of things that I've been uh, actually. I've gone back to a classic uh, recently, part because it's a book that I, I go back to every now and then and always get something from, and that's uh, The Great Gatsby. And at a time when perhaps the United States is not showing its best face to the world, looking at something that in a very short book reminds us of quite what American civilization, and despite Gandhi, yes, there is such a thing, has given to the wider world is no bad thing either. So uh, I'd, I'd recommend the classic in that sense. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we hope the next time you're at the FCC, it will be here in person, and, and we can buy you that drink at our fabulous bar downstairs. So thank you, and thank you to all of us joining us. Uh, we, this will be on our YouTube uh, channel uh, by uh, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Hong Kong time, and uh, we hope you'll all uh, uh, share it with your friends who, who maybe were not with us tonight. Thank you again. Good night. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks for joining me today. It's been a real pleasure. And thank you, Jody.